I'm, I'm really pleased to, to welcome you back this afternoon and to spend a little bit of time looking forward, but we're, we're going to look forward through the lens of the changes that COVID-19 has, has created for us and, and really the opportunities. We didn't want to just paint it as a kind of negative experience as we think, as I was talking about a little bit earlier, there have been lots of opportunities that, that have come out of this. So we're, we're uh, joined this afternoon by a very distinguished panel. I'm very pleased to introduce um, Inma Rojujis Adjura, a full professor of marketing and the director of the Digital Business Research Group um, at the University Alberta de Catalunya, so in Spain. And uh, Katia Urbach is the founder and managing director of Arbita Kind, or Kind, I think, sorry, in Germany, which is a non profit organization supporting first generation entrants. And uh, Sophia Marquis de Silva, who's associate professor at the Faculty of Psychology and Edu Educational Sciences at the University of Porto. And I apologize for my very poor pronunciation and give you an opportunity to um, introduce yourselves much better. What we wanted to do was to frame this something as a, as a, as a conversation. Um, and that when we were thinking about the session, we realized that we're actually not only talking about different national contexts and different university contexts or different higher education sectors, but we're also talking about gr different groups and different functions that we're all playing. So Imma is very much focusing on learning and teaching the students. Uh, Katia is talking about supporting students. And, and Sophia is talking both about postgraduate research students and that process of doing research during during the pandemic. So, so what I'd like to do first, actually, is just to give you each a chance to introduce yourself, and then we'll move to the first question. So, so maybe Katia, you'd like to, to just say a little bit about yourself. Yes, I'm Katia. I'm from Germany. I'm in Berlin right now, and I'm um, the first in my family who reached a university degree myself. And that is why I founded my nonprofit organization Arbeiterkind, which means something like working class kid in translation, but it's a very German word, which is very, um, yeah, very well known and culturally loaded in Germany. So but it, uh, it's something similar and we use it as a word for first generation students as we don't have another word for it. Um, and I founded this organization, I started telling my story and uh, it was a big surprise success. And uh, today, 13 years later, we have 6,000 volunteers all over Germany in 80 local groups. And we go into schools, uh, we give talk about our experience, we give talks um, about going to university, about finances. Um, and it's not only for first generation students, but for all of them, so that they can have a conversation about what they are going to do, what their background is. And we also go into universities and we have a large community and it goes up to also getting into the first job. And we also have PhD groups now, so we are a huge uh, community. Uh, of first generation students from and for first generation students and uh, our volunteers go also from students up to retired people so um, yeah we are a large community and it's um, yeah it's very rewarding to have each other out You're, yeah thank you so much that's really good and i love the way that you talked about you're, you're telling stories, as telling stories has been such a huge part of, of the I Belong project, and particularly important, I think, when you don't see people in person, that you have those kind of more informal ways to connect. So, but we'll hear more from you, Katia, in a little bit. Imma, do you want to just introduce yourself and then we'll come back to you for a little bit more explanation? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Uh, for inviting me to this event and giving me the opportunity to share with you the experiences of the Open University of Catalonia, which we call the UOC. The UOC was founded uh, 25 years ago in Barcelona as a state-of-the-art technological research university. It was then um, the first university ever to run exclusively online, not only in Spain, but also in Europe. And currently it has more than 25,000 students and about almost 6,000 researchers and teaching staff. This makes um, the UOC as one of the largest universities in Spain. 
I joined the university uh, at the end of the first in academic year, so almost 25 years ago. And I have been working there in teaching activities and in research activities. Um, you will see, because later on I will explain to you how we manage, why, how we design the, um, our teaching activities as faculty members, what are our responsibilities, and how we build and coordinate the entire groups of, um, of instructors and tutors that participate in these teaching activities and do, in fact, a great, great job. Um, my expertise you have seen is in, is in, is in marketing, it's not in psychology, it's not in education, but from this very beginning, I have been researching, I have been doing my research on individual experiences, on per personal experiences uh, online. And the understanding of these experiences help us to better understand uh, how students feel and how students react to our initiatives online. And this is much uh, more or less what I, what I do and what I'm interesting, interested to do. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Emma. It's great because you're gonna share with us some of the work you do that you were doing as well prior to the pandemic to, to help students to feel like they belong. Uh, Sophia, can I ask you to introduce yourself now? Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sofia Marcos da Silva. I'm based at the University of Porto as Associated Professor. Um, well, I teach research methodologies um, and I hope that some of the experience of doing that, uh, uh, I, I can speak about that as well in this session. Uh, I do research mainly on young people in a diversity of contexts, uh, mainly peripheral contexts, either geographic or socially peripheric uh, uh, context. Um, I'm a member of the I Belong team and I was involved uh, for more or less five years in a national level program on digital inclusion. Thank you. And I know there's some great stuff you've been doing community building with your postgraduates and the new opportunities for research that have come through the pandemic. But I wanted to start by inviting Imma to tell us a little bit more about the work in, 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 in Catalonia around what we can learn from the work that you were already doing online prior to the pandemic, particularly around helping to create a sense of belonging and for students to feel part of communities when they might be perhaps geographically at distance from each other. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, well, the UOC was conceived as an open university, which means that it seeks to provide access to higher education to every single person willing to engage in a university program, regardless of their physical location and their personal, functional and professional backgrounds. The UOC education model has been the university's most distinguishing trademark since its beginnings. This model puts the student's activity rather than the teaching staff activity center stage. Also, it aims to offer an effective and personalized solution to the student's needs while leveraging digital technologies. The model takes into consideration the diverse profile of e-learners and it's based on three pillars. The learning resources that are made available to students, the continual personalized guidance and support they receive from teaching staff and peer collaboration within a networked community. The environment in which all these three elements converge is the UOC virtual campus. There, every student can find the activities assigned, all the learning materials and resources that they need to perform the activities. Their course instructors, of course, the tutors that provide guidance and personal support, and their fellow students. Right from the start, the UOC completely shifts the role of teaching staff. Instead of already in a traditional teaching model, the university adopted an integrated student support system based on distributed teaching. As a result, one of the most distinctive features of the UOC staff, teaching staff, is their ability to take part in teaching projects that involve teamwork and interdisciplinary tasks. 
These are three distinct faculty, well, there are three distinct faculty profiles assuming teaching duties. Faculty members who design, coordinate, and supervise the courses, part-time lecturers that function as course, real course instructors, and tutors who are part-time lecturers that act as university guidance counselors. Faculty members design the courses, ensure their quality, and select, train, and coordinate the instructors who will be truly teaching them. To design a course, the UOC faculty member prepares a teaching project that includes the competences to be developed and the course learner learning outcomes to be achieved. Based on this project, um, prepares the packages of create own learning resources that will be made available for students. Some of these resources will be published by the university, so the faculty member will select an appropriate pool of authors, train and coordinate them, and edit their work. At the end of each term, the faculty member assesses the students' learning outcomes and their satisfaction with the course and shares these inputs with instructors so as to gather the instructor's reflections and suggestions and also explore potential improvements with them, of course. Accordingly, the faculty member might update or improve the learning resources, adapt the learning strategy, change the assessment methods or criteria, or he or she might introduce learning innovations. Course instructors usually combine their teaching tasks at the UOC with a full-time job at an on-site university or are employed in professional or managerial occupations. The instructors monitor the students' activity individually, proactively assist and guide them, and assess their programs throughout the course. Each instructor takes care of a single classroom made up of 70 students maximum. Most of courses are taught in more than one classroom, so instructors work together in a group of course instructors and always under the supervision and coordination of a faculty member. Based on the teaching project prepared by the faculty member, the team course instructors collaboratively prepare and circulate the students' assignments, their solutions, and their students' group feedback. For each assignment in the course, the instructors assess and grade the students' individual performance, and they provide personalized feedback along with the corresponding grade. At the end of the term, and the end of each term, they also craft the final exams as well as their solutions to be published later on, of course. The instructor's personalized feedback contains precise message in a language that, that helps the student understand their mistakes and learn from them. Because the student can compare the solution published in the classroom with their individual answers, the personalized feedback doesn't justify the great score. Instead, it focuses on the learned objectives that have been or have not been achieved at the individual level and are particularly important in the next assignments or in a final exam, for example. Also, it adopts an encouraging and friendly tone while it conveys objective information related to the course contents and competence. And of course, it omits any judgment and criticism linked to the student's personal characteristics or background. Immediately after showing interest in being admitted to the EOC, each student is assigned a tutor. Similar to course instructors, Tutors have a full-time academic position at another university or have a professional or managerial job. UOC tutors are the first person students turn to for academic advice. They guide e-learners in their choice of their individual academic pathway and closely accompany them throughout their journey, the whole journey at the university. So tutors welcome guide and bring comprehensive and personalized support to students during the admission process and throughout their entire time at the UOC. Every tutor is an expert in a particular bachelor's or master's degree program and sometimes they are also specialized in attending to a particular collective of students within such program. For example, Students under the UOC Welcome Program for Refugees 
international students under a virtual mobility program and students enrolled in double degree programs are assigned to very specific tutors in their program. For many people, the UUC has offered them the unique, a unique chance to pursue a higher education degree which they couldn't have aspired to an early age, or it has provided them with a second chance to complete a degree they couldn't finish for a number of reasons. This is why the age structure of the UOC student community is significantly, significantly different from the age composition of the students at unsigned university, so they are older. The flex in general terms, the, the high flexibility of the educational model and the ubiquity of the virtual campus make it possible for them to work and learn at the same time. So most of the students have a full or part-time job. A number of them live in small towns or rural areas, and some are Spanish expats or international students. As of today, an 80% of students work and almost a 10% live outside of Spain. The UOC student population is scattered across 142 countries. In addition, students, there is a high proportion of students with a, with a disability, as it's usually in on-site universities in Spain. Because the UOC approach to equality and inclusion is an essential part of the university, uh, how it does it and how it it, it takes it. Uh, I would like to give you a few examples of this. For instance, the UOC doesn't put in place cutoff marks for university admission because many students are transferred from on-site universities where they studied years or even decades ago. This UOC has established a process to assess and validate and completely prior university students relatively quickly and straightforwardly. A tutor is assigned to every would be students to ensure they make informed decisions in choosing a university program, help them navigate throughout the admission process and gather all the required documents. The academic regulations concerning registration allow UOC students to enroll on a at just one course, as well as temporarily withdraw for a limited number of terms. Again, the tutor provides advice in the course registration decisions, so the student doesn't enroll in more courses than they, those they can truly, truly manage. Also, when it comes to the design and delivery of learning resources, the UOC doesn't take a one-size-fits-all view, but rather ensures that all the required didactic materials are readily available in several formats, modes, and resolutions. For example, Multimedia learning materials include a text version of audio accompanying every single video or animation. So students with hearing loss have direct access to the information. And a braille transcription of the adaptive materials is provided to students with sight difficulties. The teaching staff is also particularly focused on two constellations of students, which are non-traditional students and students with special needs. Non-traditional students are those students who are in employment, students who are carers, pregnant women, students on maternity or, in or on adoption leave, students who previously earned an adult baccalaureate degree, students who gained university access through vocational training, students who are over 30, and elite athletes. The UOC offers them personalized support and advice, particularly on course enrollment decisions, so, out, so as to make sure the learning journey that best fits their profile, they can have enough time and they achieve, they meet their personal goals in terms of education. And students with special needs are those students with disabilities, including mental health conditions and learning difficulties, students undergoing health issues, students in the process of gender transitioning, refugees, international students, international students in virtual mobility programs, and students with migratory background. This later constellation of students are highly diverse, as well as their particular needs. As a result, the support to be provided by the university to them is defined in most of cases on a case-by-case -case basis. 
And this brings me to the end of my speech. I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm highly interested in to hear your views on what I have said and answer all the questions yet you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. And I and I think that, that in terms of the sense of belonging, there's there's a lot there about personal relationships and ensuring that people have have a known person that's guiding them throughout their experience. And I imagine that for some students that takes quite a few years to go through doing a module by by module in terms of a, a, a reaching their degree. And so you talked a lot about the personalization. And I think those are probably some of the challenges that the, the, the others, both at the conference and on the panel now, have experienced. How do we how do we help students to connect with each other and with teaching staff? And how do we do the kind of things that we've traditionally done face to face? So, Katia, can, can I ask you if you could tell us a little bit about the challenges that you experienced when you had to move from, from, a, from, from your previous ways of working to, to kind of a more online function and how you, how you did kind of continue to create a sense of belonging and connection between the students that you were working with? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the typical challenge for first generation students is that they have the feeling to be between two worlds. Like there's the world where you come from, where my family comes from, from a different educational background, and then there's higher education. And uh, I always had the feeling I don't belong. I don't belong where I come from, and I also don't belong in higher education, especially in the first semesters at university. So what we try to do with Arbeiterkinde is to create a space in between. Like we have our own community of people who are first generation or former first generation students. And here people find, the students find understanding for their challenges. We tell our stories and we have realized our stories are similar. We have the similar challenges, uh, similar experiences. Of course, uh, there are nuances that are different, but there are certain um, challenges that we have in common and people feel that they can talk about these challenges in our community and they are safe. So we have groups, these local groups who are meeting and they of course are used to meet physically and that is also very important to be in physical exchange and that was a challenge um, because we had done online seminars before like workshops online but now we had to move everything online and that was a, a challenge for the sense of belonging um, also because not everyone has the same technical equipment, uh, this good computers, good internet connection. Um, the challenge was also that a lot of students moved home. And that's, that was very tough for the sense of belonging because they had to move home because they couldn't afford to live at university anymore because of the expenses. They gave up their apartments or also they didn't feel safe in this crisis. So they moved to their parents again. Um, and that was difficult because then they lost this sense of belonging uh, to, at the university. Um, and to recreate that when they are at home is really difficult because for us, it's of course, it's, it's a good that they are at university, they have the higher education experience. And then we also come in addition to that to so make them feel more at home at, and make them feel a larger sense of belonging. But now they were at home often, they were in crisis mode. A lot of students thought about quitting university. They had, um, of course, challenges concerning finances. Maybe also their parents lost their jobs or they um, had the reductions in their loans. So lots of challenges. But what we tried to do is, yeah, to do everything online. We had great online meetings, uh, but of course we also lost some, some of the students. Um, that's it's just the way, the way things are. But we tried our best to do um, group meetings, to do um, workshops, one-on-one um, -on -one meetings. And I'm also very proud that we have um, an outreach program. So our students also vol are volunteers at the same time and they go into schools. And we managed to um, come up with a format online together. And we uh, developed this program together with our uh, students and volunteers. And we did a lot of uh, events for um, schools so to also reach out. And that's also a very important component for our students because they get empowered and they feel like it's not only that I need help, 
and support, I can also give support and that empowers them. So this um, getting and giving, that's, that's a huge part. And I think, uh, but I still think that our community is and was very important in this time um, to not lose more first generation students and to give them still a sense of belonging, a community they can talk to about their difficulties and to support each other. Thank you. And, and I really think you know, it's an interesting point around the volunteering, isn't it? That, that when people get involved in volunteering, they create a sense of belonging and they start to represent their organisation, which creates that belonging. So they've got peers and they're kind of representative. Um, and it feels much better than asking for help. It, it, you know, giving help, but also getting those benefits. So, so, so that's interesting. And I think in, in the UK context, a lot of um, outreach work has shifted to online and it does provide some additional opportunities. And certainly some institutions have found it's, it's given them further reach to communities and schools that perhaps they wouldn't have engaged in. So I'll come back to you and ask you about some of the kind of new opportunities that have emerged through the pandemic. I, I want really, um, Sophia, to ask you the same question. What were the main challenges in creating and maintaining a sense of belonging for, for your students as they faced a crisis for many of them, as they couldn't carry on with their research that they planned to do? Thank you for the question. Yes, well, um, I may speak a little bit as a supervisor and the challenges that I have into making the students to keep the pace even if a lot of things changed. Uh, so I was in the middle of three projects and some as a PI and some students were involved in that project and some other students had their own research uh, projects. So it was very challenging, not, not only because we, in some cases, we needed to stop and stop and regroup and to reorganize in some cases the research design so the the it's it's not it's not an easy transfer this is just not you know open a zoom meeting and to make the interviews online instead of face-to-face -face interviews this is all ontological and epistemological decisions that are changing so this is uh, you know it could be um, there are advantages and disadvantages in doing that and we discussed that but in the, the first uh, weeks with uh, more or less 10 students developing their phd so we we needed to have some time to to reflect on how the research design would change and this took us some time and some online meetings to try to rearrange their projects and in some cases changing the research question because it's not the same question anymore it's not the same this is not doing digital ethnography it's not the same of doing traditional classic ethnography and i did some digital ethnography before the pandemic and i know that it's uh, the type of data and the type of outcomes they are not the same it's ethnography we may say so and we may uh, talk about uh, multi-sided ethnography but uh, that's uh, the the design is um, embedded within this idea of digital since the beginning it's not in the middle of the project that was the main challenge uh, so i think that's uh, that's one of the challenges of course and that demanded theoretical upda updates theoretical and conceptual reorganizations and adaptations. Uh, so the issue, the, 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 the decisions of going online in some strategies of data collection implied changes in, and in some projects it was a little bit structural changes because for example, um, doing participatory methodologies through online instead of a week it took eight months because you know converging making a common schedule to all the young people teachers uh, this is it was very very demanding it's not changing from face to face to to use an online an online platform the very own online platform has uh, pedagogic issues in there as we as we could understand from in in my uh, examples of their their work so this is not just an easy transference so there are these practical issues um and are of course uh, issues of keeping the community of students. So we have in our faculties, and I'm sure in many other 
context of uh, higher education, we, we have uh, research communities of practice. So each supervisor usually is responsible for a research community of practice in which uh, PhD students, their own PhD students, and also researchers from uh, projects uh, are involved. And we have regular meetings and regular activities. And to keep that, and usually we meet uh, once or twice a month with very uh, organized activities, presentations, give it, providing feedback, and we needed to keep that. Uh, and, and we needed to keep that for the sake of the, the overall group of students, because some of them were okay dealing with the fact that we were in lockdown, uh, but others really needed this. And this, this, this meant that I, as a supervisor, I needed to understand the diversity of PhD students that I had in my hands, because as you already said, uh, also, uh, I think Katya and Im, uh, Inma, we can, well, one activity, one, when, one action cannot have the same model to everyone. So we need tailored decisions. And at, at that point, I thought, well, I need to keep these meetings, I need to keep alive the research community of practice online because it was a way of, you know, like regulating all of us in keeping us on track, doing, uh, you know, doing what we used to do. And I think for the students, it, it was very important, you know, to see that all of us were struggling with similar issues of not being able to do the research as we planned. Uh, students here, some of them had what we call, um, they have scholarships and uh, with uh, some stays in other countries, for example, in Brazil, and they needed to, to give up that. So they didn't have that experience. So we needed to, to rework the strategies, but, but especially to, you know, to, keep, to keep the pace of the research, not to have students falling uh, in the middle of this without support, without feeling that the other colleagues were, you know, uh, with the same, uh, with the same uh, challenges. So it was important to keep the motivation, to keep the, the pace and the sense of be belonging to this community of doctoral students and to this culture of, uh, of doctoral uh, uh, programs. Um, and we kept also, that was a little bit more challenge, but I had the support of a PhD students that took in her, hand, her hands these. It was the writing community of practice. Well, it's very simple. Usually we are in a room during three hours without uh, social media, without uh, internet, just focus on writing, writing an article, a piece of uh, a paper, something. And we kept that online. So with the same pace, you know, writing for 30 minutes, resting for 10 minutes, writing. And I thought, but this is not going to work, but it worked. And it was very interesting because, you know, we did our um, activities like small, um, small games in the breaks, you know, uh, regarding the activities and related to the team. But that was very, very important to, to keep us, to keep us together. Um, so that was um, my experience regarding these PhD students. I think in the end, almost two years from that time, um, we get back to the the face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, we kept some activities online, uh, but I think for that time it was uh, it was necessary to 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 change this and not to stop everything. Thank you. Thank you. That's really interesting. And uh, I, I, I'm struck again about the challenges, but also the need for community. And so particularly Katia and Sophia, because Emma, you said you didn't change as much, but, but do any of you want to sort of share how this created new opportunities and things that you will continue, even if the pandemic and all the other consequences come to an end. I think Katia, you're willing to Yeah, there are there were lots there were lots of opportunities that we discovered that we weren't that aware of before. For example, we discovered that we have volunteers who are physically challenged and who couldn't come to our physical meetings in the past and who couldn't often participate in our activities because they needed 
transportation or they also lived a little bit further away from the city. And uh, so these volunteers could suddenly um, participate much more in our activities, in our group meetings, and also in school events, which we did online. So that was, and we could also reach people who lived in the countryside, who, um, who are maybe very busy, who have kids, who have maybe other, um, uh, yeah, other challenges or other work that they are doing. So they couldn't, um, yeah, take the time to come to our meetings or activities. So that is a big win. And that's also something we will keep. We will keep online meetings and workshops and activities. And um, we also discovered that we could keep in touch with our students who were abroad. Um, so we had some students who went abroad or who were living abroad, also volunteers, and usually they couldn't participate in our work uh, from abroad, but now they could and they could uh, do it online. We have a very active uh, group now in Brussels, for example, and they did a lot of activities. They did meetings with other groups to exchange ideas and to get to know each other. We have a blind match now. So that's an activity where a lot of groups meet and then they get mixed up and they meet another group um, from Germany or from abroad and they um, talk to each other. So. We have yeah, many more activities that we also want to keep. But I think the challenge is still to decide what, is, what are we going to do physically? What are we going to do online? And maybe what are we going to do both? So I think that's um, something we have to think about when we are moving forward. I think that's a really good point. What, what do we do online and what do we do in person? Sophia, do you want to come? Yes, in? I may have something, well, not so, well, it's not negative, but uh, it's something that uh, that make me think that, that this was an opportunity to test research methods, to see if they could handle the pressure of, you know, being done online. I did that with the, with the ethnography, but I never tried, for example, with participatory methodologies or focus group discussions or interviews. And it was really interesting to see if the method at, the, at it was thought um, could, could, could be used in the same way uh, when we go online. That was, that's in, an issue that for me as a, a research methodology teacher, it, it's, it's interesting because I'm adding a layer of this aspect while I'm teaching research methodologies now. So I always speak about how can we do it if we go online, but all the implications that that meant. The other issue was through the, the development of research online using uh, with all the challenges of, you know, trying to put together in the same Zoom uh, room students from different parts of the country because the main project I'm coordinating, it's uh, uh, being developed in the border regions of Portugal with Spain. So it's a bit far away from Porto and we travel there for three years and then we stop and start doing some uh, of these activities online. And um, I could realize um, that through the online experience, I could reach uh, different experience from young people that I couldn't understand through the questionnaires or even through the, the interviews that uh, people that are working with me developed in situ. So through the online, I could understand the effort of schools from the rural parts of the country, uh, the struggles to, to, to have the digital tools, resources, and broadband of quality in those parts of the country. So I had teachers with their mobile uh, to, to be able to, to do the focus group discussion and the, the interaction with us staying in Porto. So I could better understand some disadvantages. Uh, I already knew in some aspects, but not regarding the digital divide. So it was interesting to see how also we are able to, to understand better some of the data that was previous collected through this, uh, this, uh, this opportunity. So I think it's um, uh, I, I would keep some of the techniques uh, to do these and some of the, the strategies in combination with the uh, face-to-face interactions because it's relevant as well that but I think it was 
it, uh, I think it's a good combination and I would keep this combination for, for, future, for future research. Thank you, Sophia. And, and I, think, I think you've started to answer one of the questions that has come from the audience about how you prepare students to implement their research in the online. So in your teaching, you're now providing some insights based on your experience, both the opportunities and the, the things to take into consideration all the challenges. Yes, uh, so in each layer and also regarding ethical issues, because there is a whole world of new concerns that the digital uh, is bringing. And we need to, we need, we as teachers, supervisors, and, you know, we as institutions, we need to be much more aware of what's going on there regarding platforms and how they are also, um, you know, um, influencing how we teach and learn and our own performativity as teachers and researchers. So we need to be aware of how IT companies are producing pedagogic uh, technologies for us to use for research and, and teaching. So we need to be aware. So uh, of course that ethical issues are not only regarding data protection, uh, but they also regard that. And if we are you know, doing research with uh, young people and other type of population, we need to be aware of the implications of that and how to be transparent with our participants. And I, I tried to call the attention of that. I, 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 had a, I have a, in, the, uh, in the doctoral program, I am responsible for a, a teaching module only with 15 hours, only regarding digital methodologies. I organized that before the pandemic. And it was interesting because the first time I taught that, it was in April, 2020. So it was not on purpose. I was <laughs> planning that before, but it was, you know, on time to Perfect teach a little timing. bit about, <laughs> yes, it, so it was very, very interesting. So I think that we need, uh, who teach research methodologies, we need to start uh, integrating, not in a separate model, honestly, but uh, within all the, the research process, we need to be aware that we are for a long time uh, using digital tools, digital contexts, um, to, and studying digital objects, social objects. So I think that we need to, to do that more evidently in our curriculum. Thank you. Um, and we, we're, we're running out of time rapidly, but I do have a question for Imma, which is, is from what you've learned from students' experiences on, in online education, what would you consider to continue and use in higher education? So I think it's really that question about what is it that we can learn from your 25 years of experience that will help us moving forward? Mm -hmm. Good question. <laughs> Interesting <laughs> question. Um, well, when it comes to the digital divide, for example, make sure from the very beginning that all the students can, can have, you know, um, internet access, can have uh, devices that, uh, that can be used for learning purposes from the very beginning, already in the registration process, already when they are contacting, contacting the secretary, they find materials, they find resources, they find people, uh, support, IT support that can give this information to them and then can help them to, to have these, um, these technologies available for them. Um, also, when it, when, it, when it comes to the digital divide, uh, make sure that the contents that you prepare, the documents that you provide can be accessible, can be used by people wherever they are, however, whatever is their broadcast connection. What we do, for example, is to have the same contents preparing multimedia and many formats. So a student that is connected from, from, from a very, you know, from a very far away um, um, rural uh, area, for example, with a very bad connection can use a PDF instead of using, you know, a video uh, with many other, you know, um, formats or many other animations, for example, but the content, the basic content is available, is there in the PDF version. So we need to get used to offer 
many options, many technologies, many formats for every single person and their very specific needs that they may have. Um, also, what I would suggest uh, is that try to reduce the number of or the effort that um, teachers on online on on-site university put on communicating on I would say not communicating on delivering sessions on delivering lectures try to prepare in well advanced contents learning resources so and do this before the term starts uh, try to define a, res uh, a teaching project try to you know to capture uh, interesting resources, useful resources that are online, that are on our libraries, that have been produced by many other sources. Talk to the library to make sure that the library can buy them if they are, you know, they are not public, they are not accessible to everybody, for example. Try to do this well in advance um, and try to make sure that these resources can be understood by the students without your help. Uh, so try not to use much, or you can use a textbook, of course, but try to use not exactly textbooks, but truly learning resources, something that can help them to understand the content, to understand the course without your help. And try to focus your effort on guiding them, on making sure that they are using the resources appropriately, making sure that they understand the assignment, and guide them across this journey. So um, I would say that this is more or less, you know, a way that is closer to an open university or how an open university works. But I think that is um, the most appropriate way to to navigate uh, on the on the online sphere. I think. Um, I don't know if it's helpful, but um, this is, you know, an off the cuff reflection. Um, no, thank you, thank you, and I think I think you're right that that preparing good resources in different formats feeds into kind of principles of universal design, doesn't it, and inclusion, and and I think I, I really don't have much more time. I've already run over, um, but so thank you all so much for sharing, and 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 I can see that there's so much more we could have talked about. They certainly could have given us longer time for this panel, but thank you for sharing and, and coming today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so very much. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Just a short notice. Thank you, Liz and panelists. Uh, we now have a short break during which we will uh, play another of the videos that we prepared. And then we continue with the final uh, panel. Uh, and that's uh, sharing power with students. Um, so stay with us and we will play video now. <laughs> 